Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, BC 106, our course on interpreting scripture. Thank you all for joining. Let's pray. Let's take a moment to pray and get started. Good morning, everybody in class. Happy Tuesday. Let's pray. We'll start. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and study your word, be equipped to live for you, to serve you, to grow in you, to serve people. Thank you, Father, for everyone who is in the class here, those who are online and those who will be joining us uh, in the e-learning. Thank you for all these students. Uh, we pray for the impartation of your wisdom, your grace, the work of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm glad we have the projector here. So you can uh, you can follow with me. Last class was a little difficult uh, without the projector. So let's quickly review uh, what we were doing towards the end of the last class. And uh, then we go forward from there. So why not? I need to share. What's happening? It's not letting me share God's word. All right, there it is. Share. Okay. So um, just sharing the notes from uh, uh, lesson one and two. So we began this course by going through the APC book, God's Word, The Miracle Seed where we uh, just wanted to help us understand the importance of the Word of God in the life of, of the believer and how to assimilate the Word, how to make the Word a part of our lives, right? How you meditate in God's Word, and how the Word of God can go into, into your heart. Because only the Word that goes into our heart, that is sown in our heart, that that takes root in our heart, is going to produce in our lives, right? Things that we know intellectually, maybe it gives us some information, maybe it helps us a little bit mentally. But really for the word to produce in our lives, it must go into our heart. So we emphasize that we went through the process of meditation. And that's in the book, God's Word, The Miracle Seed. Now last week, I was trying to introduce some of these terminologies and all that without the project, it was a little difficult. But I guess now you can see it. and uh, you can all get the PDF, right? And if you want to print it out, just go to the office and use the printer, okay? If you want to, if you want to print it out. If you're fine with the PDF, that's fine. Uh, the reason I'm giving this these lectures um, class by class is because sometimes I may update the content uh, based on what we talk and interact, and I'll, I might add some new information. So that's why I'm giving it lecture by lecture as as we put it together. Uh, I don't want to give the whole notes because then I can't change or it's difficult to change in between. So handling God's word, we explain some terminology. It's, it's not important for you to remember these things, but just know that, you know, if somebody says hermeneutics or somebody says exegesis, what are they meaning, right? So, uh, and, and generally in conversation, people may not use it unless you go to a seminary. They will be using this kind of language, but in everyday life uh, normally we don't use that now as we began to uh, make progress we we said we went through some scriptures that we are familiar with that all scripture is given by inspiration of god second timothy 3 16 and 17 and we also said second peter 1 that uh, the holy spirit guided human human authors to write so the inspiration was from God, but the writing was people. People were writing it. That means they used their language. Right? Uh, they used the language of the day. They used, you know, uh, the 
the conditions of their day to talk about things. So we have to understand that there is the divine side. There is also the human side to the Bible. Right? Um, we talked about the need for interpreting scripture. How, for example, in Acts 8, there was this Ethiopian man. Uh, he was a very rich man, very educated man. He was reading Isaiah 53, but he did not understand. Though, though he was very educated and all of that, he didn't understand what he was reading. And that's where Philip goes, or sent was sent by the Holy Spirit, to help interpret the scripture, help him understand what he was reading. Okay. Another example is Nehemiah chapter 8. We looked at verse 8 last time, where as the scriptures were being read, the people stood up to hear the word of God. But it was Ezra the scribe and others who helped them understand what they were hearing. Right? So they read the scriptures. People were very reverent. They stood up. They heard the word. But then they helped them understand what was being taught and uh, what was being read. Right? So we need, even today, to help people understand the scriptures. And this is where we went. You know, this is how far we went. We talked about what are the challenges in biblical interpretation. For you and me to interpret the Bible, understand the scriptures, what are some of the challenges? And we just outlined this. For example, there's a spiritual gap. Uh, revelation was pro is in the Bible is progressive. That means Abraham didn't know everything Moses knew, and Moses didn't know everything David knew, and David didn't, you know, the revelation, the light became brighter and brighter as we journey through time. The advantage we have is we can look back and we can read everything right from Genesis to Revelation. We can look back. Right? But the people in the Bible, as they were in, in Bible times, as they were journeying, Revelation was progressive. They didn't have everything. So, for example, Job, uh, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. So you can imagine Job did not have the revelation we have. So Job didn't know how to fight the, the devil. Job did not have Ephesians chapter 6, you know, put on the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the He didn't have that. So when Satan came against him, he didn't know. First of all, he didn't know that it was Satan who was coming against him. He didn't know how to resist. He didn't have that revelation. But you and I today, we have all of Genesis revelation. We know how to contend with the devil. We know how to put the shield of faith and quench every fiery dart of the wicked. But remember, Jesus said this. He said, to whom much is given, much is required. That means God expects much more from you and me than from those before us. Because to us, much has been given. Right? We have the whole scriptures. Job didn't have, or you know, as we go through, but they didn't have the revelation that we have. Right? So to whom much is given, much is required. So God will ask you and me, did you live by the light of revelation? Right? There's another thing, and I'll just mention this here. When Jesus spoke about the parable of the sower in Mark 4, he also went on to say this. He said, to whom much is given, more will be given. To whom who has little, even what he has will be taken away. So what do you mean? It doesn't make sense, right? See, the person who has little, the little he has will be taken away. To whom has much, more will be given. So like, that is not right. But what, what is the context? The context is revelation. That means the person who is receiving revelation, to him more will be given. So he will have more. But the person who is rejecting revelation has got little bit. Even what little he has will be taken away. Because he's not receiving that little. The context is the word of God. Mark chapter 4. It means if you're receiving the word, more word will be given. More revelation will be given. But if you're rejecting the word, then what little you have, you'll also lose. Two points you got. It's not in the notes. But to whom much is given, much will be required. To who, who is receiving a lot, more will be given. So it's so important how we receive the seed of the word, how we receive the word. If we are taking in more and more, God will give you more. But if you're rejecting and you're just saying, okay, I want only so little, even the little you have will be taken away. Mark chapter 4. Right? Okay, that's a side thought. But <coughs> we're talking about, <coughs> sorry, 
um, the challenge in biblical interpretation. <clears throat> All right. So we talked about a spiritual gap. And there's a time gap, the time in which the scriptures were written, the times in which we live. Right? Uh, so there's a time difference, there's a geographical difference. It was written mainly in the Middle East. We are living in different parts of the world. There's a cultural gap, meaning uh, their culture and our culture is very different. So the customs in their culture, we need to understand. Because some of the things that are written in scripture are based on the culture in those days. For example, in those days, and you'll read, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little later. Um, if you agree, uh, uh, so this, uh, we read about this in the book of Ruth. Um, uh, if people, two people made a promise to each other and they agreed to it, somebody will take off the shoe and give the shoe. As a sign to say that I agree to this uh, covenant or to this deal. Today we don't do that. But we can't go and take that chapter and verse and say, hey, it's there in the Bible. You take your shoe, give me your shoe. <laughs> what is this? We can quote chapter and verse, give me a shoe. No, that is a custom, right? That they practiced in their culture. It's in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Bible. Yes, it is chapter and verse. But it is a culture cultural thing it's not something that you and i have to practice today then we'll all be walking with one shoe <laughs> yeah, it's not practical right it's not so understand cultural gap understand language gap literary gap we will look into all these things okay so when we are reading the bible and when we're interpreting scripture we need to transcend these gaps that means we need to understand oh this is cultural uh, and, and, and therefore, how will this apply to us today? Now, we need to interpret it correctly, keeping all these things in mind. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start from here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Everyone's with me so far? Yeah? That was just a very quick review. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The Apostle Paul is um, writing to Timothy. So he's teaching Timothy. You know, how to pastor or take care of the church in Ephesus. And um, he's giving him instructions how to be a good man of God, how to be a good uh, spiritual leader to the people of God. And of course, he writes a lot in First Timothy, Second Timothy. Um, you'll be studying both these epistles uh, in detail, verse by verse, later on. Uh, but in this instruction, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, this is what Paul says. He says, be diligent. He's telling Timothy, be diligent or be very careful to present yourself approved to God. That means you present yourself in a way that God will approve. And right? how you live, how you conduct yourself. He's a spiritual leader. Timothy is a spiritual leader. He's pastoring the church in Ephesians. So he's telling, Paul is telling Timothy, you know, as a leader, you present yourself in a way that God will approve, approved by God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Be a worker who won't have to hide his face. <laughs> that means you work in such a way that God will approve you and you can look God and say, God, I've done my best. Right? I have, I've done what you want me to do. I followed your instructions. I've done my best. So a worker will, will not be ashamed. And then in the light of that, as a worker who is approved by God, as a worker who is not going to be ashamed, in the light of that, what must he do? He said, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this is the responsibility of a spiritual leader, huh? of a pastor. Timothy was a pastor, spiritual leader. What must you do? You must rightly divide the word of truth. That means word of truth, God's word. Rightly divide means to cut it straight. Suppose you make a loaf of bread. You want to cut slices for everybody to eat. You have to cut it straight. You don't cut like this. You know, then it looks messy. 
But he cut it nicely. He cut it straight. Rightly divide the word of truth. So he's telling you make a straight cut. Rightly correct, uh, correctly cut or divide. Basically saying, interpret the truth, the word of truth. See, God's word is truth. It's the word of truth. Nothing wrong with the word. But as a minister of God, as a leader, you and I have the responsibility to rightly divide, correctly interpret the word of God. So that is our responsibility. Just like it is our responsibility to present ourselves approved to God, it is our responsibility to be workers who are not ashamed, to work well. It is also our responsibility to rightly divide the word of God. Yeah. So that's why understanding how to do it is so important. In Let's go to Acts 17. Uh, this is Paul. He's in uh, uh, he's in Ephesus, okay, and uh, he he has uh, sorry he's on, he's on his way to Athens where he's going to be preaching and so on. But in Acts seventeen, we read about certain believers who are at, who actually were from Berea, and uh, let's read that Acts seventeen. Please follow me, ten and eleven. Um, it says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went in the, the synagogue of the Jews. These, that means the people in Berea, who were in the Jews, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So what's it saying? Paul and Silas, they came to Berea. Now they were on the missionary journey, second missionary journey. They were going, they were from Thessalonica, they went to Berea, then they're going to Athens. So they're on the missionary journey. Uh, so they come into this place called Berea. And it says these, and they went to, as they normally do, they went into the synagogue. They started off with the Jews, right? So the Jewish people are there. They go to the synagogue. And Paul uh, is preaching. Now remember in those days, he only had the Old Testament. So from the Old Testament, he would preach Jesus Christ. Okay? So you can imagine, Paul is using Genesis to Malachi. And from Genesis to Malachi, he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching Jesus Christ. And these are Jewish people. They also have Genesis to Malachi. So what it's saying here is, these people, they went and they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was telling them was correct or not. Right? That's what it says, verse 11. They received the word, that means they sat and they listened. They received the word. But they also did something. They searched the scriptures daily. As they were sitting and listening to Paul, Paul is explaining from the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. They searched to see if what Paul is saying is correct or not. So this is a practice you and I can take today. In fact, I would say we must do it today. Just like how they did. Today, we have the whole Bible. We have the Old Testament and New Testament. When you listen to anybody preach, whether it's me, any of our Bible college lecturers, or whether you listen to a sermon online or in church or wherever, you have to search. You have to think. Is what this person is saying is correct or not? Like how these people did, right? You have to be fair-minded. That means you be very thoughtful, clear in your mind. And you search the scriptures to see 
if what this person is it right or not like how these people did right so we must understand that in our day and time uh like paul said there are all kinds of winds of doctrine winds of teaching all kinds of things going on you know sometimes i i, I don't want to say this lightly but sometimes i find it very funny Every other person will be apostle so and so and prophet so and so. It's so cheap these days. They'll put one label, apostle, some so, prophet. So they, nobody wants to call pastor and evangelist and teacher. That is all below. <laughs> it has to be either apostle or prophet. Sometimes it'll be apostle and prophet. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Everybody's an apostle, everybody's a prophet. <laughs> What is going on? But that is what is happening, generally speaking, in the Christian world. Generally speaking. So it has become very cheap. If you wear on white suit, put your name, apostle, so and so. Finished. <laughs> Only two things you need. You need white suit and you need label, <laughs> apostle. Anyway, sad. It's very sad. But um, the problem is... Um, People are preaching and saying all kinds of things in the name of uh, ministering God's word. All kinds of things. Now, whatever comes to the mind, say. But you and I have to be careful, like these believers. See, even though it was Paul, they didn't know who Paul was. They didn't know, hey, this was an apostle, Paul, a real apostle, Paul. They didn't know. For them, Paul was Paul and Silas had come. They were teaching something. But they checked the scriptures. Is it correct? Right? So we have to be very careful these days. You know, so many, so many things, so many ideas, doctrines are going on. And we have to be very careful. And one and so whatever we learn in this course will help us to do that. How do you interpret the scriptures? And one very important thing is always. Interpret something in the light of the entirety of Scripture. Right? Somebody will take one verse. Of course, it, when you're preaching a sermon, you can only refer to a few verses because you have only 40 minutes or something. You don't have time. But how you interpret those few Scriptures must be in the light of the whole Scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation. Even though you're taking one verse in preaching or a few verses in preaching you're taking a passage and you're preaching yeah we understand in 40 minutes you can only do a few things take a few scriptures we understand that but how you interpret those scriptures you as a minister of god you have to do your homework to make sure that you are interpreting it correctly in the light of the entirety of scripture you must interpret the light of Genesis to Revelation. Yeah, you can't preach the whole thing, but when you're telling people, you have to be very careful. Okay? So, uh, when we are reading scripture, you know, some basic things we will talk about a little later on, uh, how to interpret. But basic things, you know, observation. What is the text saying? Interpretation, what does it mean? And application, how does it apply to me? It's three simple questions. Observation. Interpretation application. The application can be correct only if the observation and interpretation are correct. If the observation is wrong or interpretation is wrong, then application will also be wrong. Then somebody will get into trouble. <laughs> uh, they'll get into do something wrong. They'll blame, ah, oh, the preacher told me, or I thought the Bible said. No. Okay. So observation has to be correct, interpretation has to be correct, then application will be correct. Okay, so um, what was clear to the writer may not be immediately clear to the reader. So you and I are reading, God's servant wrote it some time back, maybe 1,000, 2,000 years ago, somebody wrote. At that time the person was writing, the Holy Spirit had inspired a thought. Or a revelation. Holy Spirit had given that person something. That person wrote it. But when we are reading it today, it may not be very 
clear, obvious. So our desire is, what was the original illumination or revelation that the Holy Spirit was giving whoever wrote it? You know, we need to study. Make a little effort. It may not just be obvious, just by reading. I mean, so understand what it is. That's our goal. Okay. Now, Martin Luther, you know, uh, of course, he said many things, but uh, this quote, I think, is very important. Um, the scriptures are to be retained in their simplest meaning ever possible. Don't make it complicated. And to be understood in their grammatical and literal sense, unless the context plainly forbids. Obscure passages are to be understood in the light of clear passages. Scripture is its own interpreter. This is a true method of interpretation which puts scripture alongside of scripture in a right and proper way. So this is good words of wisdom. And how to interpret scripture? Well, scripture is its own interpreter. Right? That means to understand something in one place, look at what other things, other scriptures say about that subject. Scripture is its own interpreter. Put scripture alongside scripture. Put all together. And then you come out with the meaning. Okay? So keep it simple. Uh, use proper language, grammar, and, and uh, so on. And he says obscure passages should be understood in the light of clear passages. So if there's something that is not very clear in one's place, well, what can you look at? Other, or what are the other passages you can look at that throws more light and that is more clearer about the same subject? So look at the clearer passages, right? and then you'll understand. We will look at some examples of this. So John Calvin, he said, it is the first business of an interpreter to let his author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. It means don't make the Bible say what you want it to say. No, you say what the author has said. Right? That is our first responsibility. So my first response when I'm going to read the scripture is, I must find out what God said through his servants, not me trying to make the Bible say what I want it to. So my responsibility is, what did God say through, you know, whoever wrote it, the scripture? What did God say through that person, not the other way? Okay. So <clears throat> uh, let's talk a little bit here now about the possibility of error during interpretation. You know, how can, how can there be error? Some people knowingly distort the word of God. They know they are playing, but they will purposely do it because they want, like we said, they want to achieve some end. They want to support their their own doctrine. <clears throat> they want to support their own idea. They may want to support their own organization. They may want to support their own agenda. So knowingly, they will distort the word. Knowingly. Some people do it. So Paul writes about this, and this, these are just uh, one or two examples. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, and verse 2, Paul says, But we, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he's comparing himself to other people. Right? So, like, meaning he's, he's drawing a contrast, saying there are people who, who they are walking in craftiness and they handle God's word deceitfully. They, they are cheating, deceitful, and they are handling God's word. Knowingly, they do. Uh, sometimes that's because of the ignorance of others. That means they, uh, they, 
they know okay the other person may not have read the scriptures or may not have may not know what i'm saying so they may knowingly distort the word right um now second Tim, second peter 316 peter is writing he's he's mentioning referring to the epistles of the apostle paul and he says as also in all his epistles speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable uh, people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So if you look at verse 15, the previous verse, you know that Peter is talking about our beloved brother Paul, 2 Peter 3.15. Uh, 3 and then he says in verse 16, he says, you see, there are people who don't understand. But without understanding, they twist the scriptures. They make it say what it's not saying. They twist the scriptures. And uh, some things are hard to understand. Un untaught and unstable people, they twist it to their own destruction. And they do this not only with the writings of Paul, but with also the rest of scripture. For example, in Paul's time, what happened was the apostle Paul had written about the resurrection. Right? So, example, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, he talked about the coming of Christ and how Jesus would come to take people away, uh, take the church away, and First Corinthians 15. So, Paul had written these things, the coming of the Lord. Within a few years, there were people who were saying, the re resurrection has already happened, and you have missed it. So within few years, people were preaching. Resurrection, finished, already happened, you have missed it. And they were destroying the faith of the believers. So Paul was writing about, he wrote about this in Timothy, that there were these people who were overthrowing the faith of some, claiming that the resurrection has already passed. So Paul had written correctly about the resurrection. But here, there were people who were twisting the scriptures and claiming it's already gone and scaring the people. Ah, oh, gone. You're here now. God has, Jesus has left you behind, kind of thing. Right? So, uh, Peter is saying, you know, these people, they, don't, they didn't understand. So, they are twisting the scriptures and they are causing a lot of problem. Right? So, um, there are people who knowingly distort. There are people who make faulty interpretations. Uh, sometimes they, um, you know, they, sometimes it happens out of ignorance because they have not studied. They have not made the effort to search the scriptures. Then they just preach and, okay, they are sincere, but they are wrong. Why? Because they haven't studied. They haven't searched. They may be genuine people, sincere people, but they are wrong in their interpretation. So, like for example, and I, and I was just uh, talking about this to somebody, I think on Sunday or something. We were talking about, say, so like example, and I'm not putting people down, but this we're just looking, talking about the facts that example in in India, here, especially in in, in rural parts, right. Uh, there are people, for example, pastors and all of that, they don't have the opportunity to go somewhere and be taught the word of God. They just start ministry. Right? They hear about Jesus, they get saved, and they'll start. Start a church, start ministry. But they have never been trained. They have not spent time understanding the scriptures. Now, they're sincere people. There's no question. They're genuine people sincere people but because they don't have the understanding they can say and do a lot of things that are actually wrong that are against the scriptures they're sincere but they don't have the understanding they've not had the opportunity to be taught the word so they'll just open the bible some verse they'll read say something <laughs> and and so you know it's a problem it's a problem. 
because it will hurt people. It will hurt people. You know? And uh, so I was just discussing about that. So the fact is, sometimes people do fault, make faulty interpretations. Uh, they are sincere. They're good people, but they don't have the understanding. They don't have not been taught. They have not been trained. Now, I just want to. This is a side note. Listening to wrong teaching is like eating spoiled food. Okay, so go with me to Hebrews, uh, chapter twelve. Hebrews chapter 12, not chapter 12, chapter 13. <clears throat> uh, let me, yeah. So, Hebrews 13, verse 9. Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied by them. Very interesting. Hebrews 13, 9. He's saying, don't get caught up with various and strange doctrine or teaching. Those are Go with all these strange ideas and teaching, you know. Don't. And in trying to explain what he's saying, the writer of Hebrews continues. It says, the heart should be established by grace or made firm by the grace of God, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied. That means you're eating food which is of no use. Like it's like almost like bad food it's so for us to pay attention to strange doctrines all these wrong teaching all this it's like you are putting bad food into your body he's comparing drawing comparison so we have to be careful it's not like yeah yeah i'll just listen to anything and everything no because if you are putting strange doctrines, putting them into your heart. It's like eating spoiled food, bad food. It's not good for you. you. You'll have to have, you know, you'll have some bad effects on uh, on your spiritual life. So you have to, you and I also have to be careful. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, there is a possibility of error during interpretation so we have to be careful so now let's talk about the bible as a human book and as a divine book you all with me so far okay so as a divine book uh what can we say about the bible meaning as a book that has been given by the inspiration of god we can say the bible is inerrant that means it is truth there is no error the bible being a divine book is authoritative meaning it's final authority in our lives we can't we're not going to question it challenge it and say no 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 so for example in today's society one of the arguments is oh the bible is an old book it was it is outdated it is meant for people who were living hundreds of years ago today we are modern people those things those way that way of life doesn't apply to us the Bible is authoritative. It is final. Even today, we live and we submit to the truth of the word of God. We submit to it. This is the way we're supposed to live. You're not going to change that. Right? It's authoritative. So the Bible, number three, the Bible being a divine book has unity. Uh, that means it's not going to contradict itself. Uh, if... And when there are discrepancies, uh, we need to interpret it in the light of the harmony of scripts. Okay, it seems like there's some something not clear. Okay, let's interpret it in the light of the rest of scriptures. Right? Uh, it is uh, because it contains unity, 
passages are not very clear. You interpret in the light of primary passages. Uh, if it seems like there are two possible interpretations, then go with the one that's clear and sensible. Right? And um, the Bible often interprets itself. Uh, we also understand progressive revelation. That means um, things became clearer and clearer over time. There were some things God said, I told you that then, now I'm telling you now. Example. In the beginning of the ministry, Jesus told his disciples, when you go, don't take anything with you. Just go. But towards the end of his ministry, he said, now when you go, take your bag, take your purse, and take a sword. So Matthew 10, when you go, he said, don't take anything. Just go. Whatever people give you, you eat, you're fine. You're, the laborer is worthy of his food. But later on, before his crucifixion, he said, now you take things with you when you go. So the instruction was, that instruction was temporary for a period of time. Then it was changed. Right? So we understand that, right? Um, that, that you'll find that. Uh, I'm just giving one example. So some commands were changed at a later period of time. Uh, the Bible being a divine book is supernatural. That means God works through his word, through the word of God. Now, the Bible as a human book. All of you, you're following me, right? Okay. All right. The Bible as a human book, that means because it was written by human authors, what can we say? Um, the biblical writing, it is recorded in the language and it followed normal grammatical meaning, including figurative language. Right? So, uh, we treat it like as you would treat any text. Right? It is written in a sentence. The words are put in a certain way so that they convey a certain meaning. Don't jumble it and make it say something else. Right? We can do that, right? Suppose I, I write a sentence. Um, you know, please meet me today. You can jumble up the words and say, you know. <laughs> Today, meet, so whatever, I'm just trying to say. Sometimes you can jump, if there were more words, you could jumble up the words and make it mean something different, right? We shouldn't do that, right? Just read it like a normal sentence, how we read it in any language. So, number two, uh, the writing of the Bible was written to specific hearers. And the people were living in a certain historical, geographical situation. So it, co it communicated a certain meaning to those people. So we must try to understand what that, what that meant to the people. Right? Try to understand it in their context. Okay. So number three, the Bible is influenced by the cultural environment uh, in which the human writer wrote. So. Uh, example. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, you'll find the phrase, gird up your loins. Huh? Gird up your loins. So what is that? Gird up your loins. Okay. So, uh, it simply means that just like how in some parts of India, like I think South India, you know, we people will wear dhoti. They, they wear the dhoti. So they wear a certain kind of clothing, loin, around their loins, on the waist. It's like a dhoti. Gird up the loins means you bring that dhoti up here. You make it, you bring it a half way. So then they can move, they can walk more freely. Right? So that phrase is in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. He girded up his loins. So what is this girded up? The, what did it mean? Oh, simply means uh, he, they, had, they wore this long cloth, so then they put it up here so that they could move more freely. But then when he says, gird up the loins of your mind, oh, 
is using a figure of speech. On our mind, we're not wearing any dhoti. No, no. But he's saying, take action in your mind. Prepare your mind for action. Be alert in your mind. That is the interpretation. But he's using a language, something that was culturally understood, cut up your loins, in the context of the mind. Oh, that means be, be ready to take action in your mind. That's what it means, right? But so we have to un interpret certain scriptures. Let's give one example where uh, what was relevant to them culturally is being used. A couple other things. Number four, uh, the Bible was accepted and understood in the light, of the light of its context. So when people during Bible times and early times, they also understood scripture in the light of its context. That's how they understood it. And we also must do the same thing. Um, uh, the Bible takes on the nature of specific literary form. So some is historical, some is poetic, you know, uh, so especially the Psalms, they're all songs written. So they're very poetic in nature. So we understand that. It has to be interpreted that, that way. So in poetic um, uh, literature, sometimes the same thought is repeated in two sentences, two statements, but the same thought. It's being repeated. Right? But that's a style of that writing. So we have to understand like that. And uh, uh, use basic principles of logic and communication. So there is the divine side to the scripture. God inspired it. But there is also the human side. Man wrote it. So when man was writing it, they used the language and the style and the practices of writing that they had in those times. And so when we are trying to interpret scripture, we must follow those rules of interpretation. OK? Any questions before we go for a break? You all with me so far? OK, let me just see if there are any questions from our online class. Any questions from students online uh, on this lesson so far? You all following me? OK. So when we come back after the break, we'll get into the next chapter. We will talk about methods and tools to study. Right? What are some of the methods to study the scriptures? And what are some tools we can use? Okay, I'll, I'll share that with you, some tools. So it is good to. Uh, get to know what are the methods, what are the tools to use to study the scriptures. And we will go through that after we come back from the break. Okay, see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you.